speak about neoliberalism. What are the historical origins of this movement? All right. What happened was that, of course, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, many on the right felt that they had been wrong-footed by things that had happened and that there was a fair amount of hostility to sort of laissez-faire theories with regard to the market and a lot of political pressure for the state or various states to try to do something. And so what they felt they had to do was that they had to discuss and convene various groups to decide what it was that they should do in order to respond to this. And, of course, there are many examples of this, but the one that's important for neoliberalism is there was one in 1936 called the Colloque Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann was an American who wrote a book called The Good Society. But what's interesting is a large number of Europeans found his positions very attractive and a way to get around what they saw as some of the issues and problems being raised by the left. And so they convened a meeting in Paris uh, in '36. And the reason why it's important for what happens later after the war is that many of the people who attended the colloque Walter Lippmann eventually became members of Mont Pelerin Society, which I'll talk about in a minute. It is interesting to note that Walter Lippmann himself was not one of them, <laughs> that the whole thing was convened around him but that he uh, felt nervous around these people. Anyway, World War II intervenes. Of course, there's all this disruption in Europe. And these people cannot in any way, you know, sort of discussion in those circumstances. So what happens is that, in effect, they had to wait until after the war was over. When the war was over, the one or two protagonists decided that it was time to really have a serious discussion about what to do, not only about the left, but the fact that essentially they felt that their position had been defeated by Keynesianism, that the culture was hostile to their views, and so forth. So Friedrich Hayek is the main protagonist at this time period and convenes a group called the Mont Pelerin Society in, in 1947. And by the way, the name was purposely anodyne, so you couldn't really tell what it was about. It just turns out that Mont Pelerin was the first place that they met uh, after World War II. It doesn't have any deeper meaning than that. So they didn't call it something like reinventing the right and so on? Yeah. What's interesting is <laughs> they also talked about that. I mean, that's what's fascinating to go into history, is they thought that they might want to do that, or even Hayek wanted to name it the Acton Tocqueville Society, which I also think would have been a massive error, but whatever. And then they finally decided, no, we don't want to let on what we're about to the outside world. And that's actually an important aspect, I think, of, of the neoliberals, ultimately. So anyway, they formed the society, and the society, when it forms, is quite small. It's only about 39, 40 people, something like that. But it becomes this major debating society for what should the right do after its great defeat, both in the Great Depression and in World War II. And the doctrine that they felt they were stretching towards, they themselves called neoliberalism in this early period. So that's one reason why I know there's a lot of people out there who think, oh, neoliberalism is just the left swear word, you know, we shouldn't use it and so forth. I mean, you know, as a historian, that's what they were trying to find, something beyond classical liberalism, which would be attractive in the post-war world. And so neoliberalism actually is a great name for them, even though they stopped using it by, you know, sometime around the early 50s. They would call themselves really misleading things, like classical liberals, which is, by the way, just wrong. Classical liberals are people like Enlightenment figures or John Stuart Mill or somebody like that, and they actually disagree tremendously with those uh, figures. So that's another issue. Anyway, what happens is that this organization grows and grows and is capped at 500 members. It still exists, and it never has gotten larger than 500 members. And the other thing that people should know about it, and I find that people really, even on the left, are incredibly ignorant, don't even know what Mont Pelerin is, so forth. The important thing about it is that you can't just join it yourself. It's not a sort of organization, well, oh, well, I agree with these people, so I think I'll sign up and join. No, 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 no. Um, in the first 
20 years or so, Hayek more or less decided whether you could join or not. And then afterwards, after that, you have to be proposed by two members and then vetted. <laughs> so it's very much a closed society. Right. And what's interesting about that is that when you read some of their works, you think, oh, they're all for liberty and free thought and so forth and so on. But what's interesting is that internally in the society, they decided early on that they didn't want to have a lot of dissenting voices, that they wanted people who more or less could be taken to agree with the larger political positions mm -hmm. so that they could argue out tactics and strategy rather than, you know, continually fighting over what do we really believe and blah, 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 blah. So it's really important to see it as a kind of a really pretty close society. Does that have anything to do with its early membership, such as when Van Mises accused most of the society of being socialist? And this is anecdotal. I don't know if it actually happened. Well, that really happened, yeah. What's more important is that when they started out, they didn't know what they were really working towards. In other words, they all knew that they wanted to praise the market and saw the market as the central organizing principle of all of human society. I mean, they all agreed on that, okay? But what they didn't know is they didn't know, well, what would a political organization believe that wanted to promote the market? I think the, the, what, some of the first things that they decided very early on was that the older laissez-faire story had essentially run its course and was hopeless. That's why that Mises story is so important, because some of the people that they had invited in these early meetings were, in fact very much proponents of laissez-faire, Mises being one of the best examples. And those people actually became disaffected with what developed over time. What developed over time is they decided they no longer believe the classical liberal story that the market just kind of naturally happens and naturally expands and so forth. They felt, in part because they were behind the eight ball after World War II, the whole society could turn against the market in various ways and develop all kinds of institutions that were anti-market. And so what was needed was to have an active group who wanted to build the kinds of markets that they thought should exist. And you see, that's why it's not classical liberalism anymore. Classical liberalism had no image of the need to take over the state to build a market society. And that is probably the premier characteristic of neoliberalism. So what exactly do you mean by market society? What, what's the sort of economic and political background that replaced classical liberalism in a bit more detail? See, this is where it starts to become more complicated and, and really needs a full history because they themselves, again, didn't have a clear single story about that in the beginning. And in fact, the one way to talk about the different trends within Mont Pelerin is to think of it as kind of composed of various strands of neoliberalism. One very early important strand is the kind of Austrianism that Hayek himself represented. Another strand, which was very important in the development of German political economy right after the war. And then the Chicago School of Economics in the United States. So notice that it isn't all just economists either. That what, what happens is that there are different groups, really different philosophical groups, who are arguing out what is their common political program given their different positions. Now, I'm, I'm coming back to answer your question. What is the market <laughs> that they all supposedly believe in? Well, see, it's not the same thing for all the different sub-schools that I just mentioned. So, for example... For Hayek, and this is why Hayek is so important, although not the only person who develops neoliberalism, but he's so important because he poses a new vision of the market that did not exist prior to, I would say, the 1930s. Prior to the 30s, markets were thought of, at least amongst neoclassical economists, as kind of allocation of scarce means to given ends. And one often sees that definition still in introductory textbooks. The problem is that that definition has totally been superseded by the Hayekian definition, which is that a market is not that, it's a super information processor that knows more than any human being knows or ever could know. So the idea that the market is an epistemic process is very much a new definition of what a market is. 
And I would argue that over time, this comes to dominate the other visions of the market that are also present in Mont Pelerin. But let me give you some examples of what they are. For the ordo liberals, the market really is much more about entrepreneurialism generally. And we have to make it easier for entrepreneurs to do new and different things that people couldn't know themselves that they wanted, so forth and so on. So that's a very ordo liberal view. But ordo liberals, interestingly enough, are also very wary of monopoly or have a big corporate power. Right. They lose out over time, at least with that respect. So see, their vision of the market is somewhat different. And then let's take the Chicago School. The Chicago School thought that the idea of equilibrium in neoclassical economics was the best way to describe a market. So you see the tension within Mont Pelerin even, that the Chicago is pushing this slightly altered neoclassical vision, whereas the Hayekians really are opposed. You see this why you know this becomes much more an issue of wanting to argue specific doctrinal histories. I would argue that Hayek's vision comes to dominate the neoclassical vision. And so it becomes more and more the main neoliberal vision of what a market is. But that takes a long time. It doesn't happen right away at all. It takes decades and decades before that happens. You talk about the neoliberal thought collective, right? So this sort of cumulative process of different ideological positions within what we're calling neoliberalism. Yeah. And you claim that there's this whole institutional infrastructure of think tanks and policy advisors and so on who can be described as a Russian doll with respect to this initial neoliberal doctrine whose history you've just described. Could you expand a bit more on that? Sure, of course. Now, when people hear the story I've already told you, that there isn't a single set of tenets or ten commandments (laughs) that all neoliberals signed up to throughout history, they start coming back and saying, well, there's no such thing as neoliberalism then, right? I mean, there's just all this different visions and this argument. Well, see, you know, they have developed institutional structures to make sure there is both continuity and a kind of unity to their political project, even though they might differ on certain doctrinal points. And that's why I think it's really important to talk about a neoliberal thought collective. A neoliberal thought collective is a group of people who realize that even though they don't agree in every single tenet, they are all working towards the same goals using many of the same institutions. Right. That gets us to the Russian doll aspect. Because one way to talk about that is to talk about, the as we do, I and other historians, the Mont Pelerin Society itself, right? I mean, you know, you're not part of the Mont Pelerin Society if you're not part of the project, even though you may have arguments within Mont Pelerin. But... Mont Pelerin is not the whole story, and I hope no one gets the impression that I have ever argued that, or my my co-authors in the road from Mont Pelerin. They don't argue that either. What happens is that as Mont Pelerin comes around to the idea that markets really are epistemic, but that they have to construct them, they realize that they have to set up all these kinds of special organizations in order for that to happen. And so... Even though Mont Pelerin is a kind of a closed discussion society, which is itself very cosmopolitan, a lot of people misunderstand neoliberalism as some kind of projection of American economics or American social thought. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's not true. From the very beginning, it was cosmopolitan. There are people from a large number of countries, a large number of different backgrounds. They were not all economists, which is interesting. There are a lot of philosophers involved. So their job is to kind of think through the big issues, some kind of joint idea of, of what they really believe. But then those beliefs themselves have to be adjusted to local political contexts. In other words, the culture in question and the politics at that particular juncture in that particular nation in question. So the way this happens, you have the first ring of the Russian doll, or, or let's, let's the next to largest Russian doll, which is a couple of think tanks, actually quite a few think tanks, that exist to translate neoliberal ideas into the politics of the particular nation. So just to give you some ideas, what I'm thinking of, you have the Institute for Economic Affairs in Britain, you've got the AEI and Heritage, 
and Cato in America. You have the Fraser Institute in Canada. You have the Stockholm Network for the uh, Nordic countries and so on. And what's interesting about that is that this is all, these are being built up consciously to be similar to each other, even though they're adjusted to the local situation. So most people don't know that there's a mother think tank, which generates think tanks, sort of spawns think tanks in various countries, and it's called the Atlas Foundation. All of these are essentially being run by people who are members of the neoliberal thought collective. And, you know, that gets me to why I think of it as a Russian doll. There are all these different layers of seemingly different institutions that are built up around the political project, okay? But the reason it's a Russian doll is because the same human beings often occupy different positions in the different institutions. And they don't often admit their multiple activities, okay? So another level might be a couple of specialized academic units that essentially get taken over by neoliberals. So in, we've already mentioned one, the Chicago School is one, but there's George Mason University outside of yeah. D.C. So what happens is that people who are members of these units might also be members in some way of a one of the important think tanks. And they might also, or not, be members of Mount Pelerin Society. So you see, there is really much more closely held together than people realize. It's just that no one's going to go through and, you know, do this kind of roster of, you know, who belongs to what and what are the connections and so forth. And by the way, th that's not the end of the Russian doll. There's more. Um, and then what happens is that as the think tanks grow, they develop and differentiate into different kind of think tanks. Early think tanks really were about generating thought uh, policy proposals for particular countries. But then the think tanks themselves divide up into further political action arms over and above the sort of the think part of the think tank. So you mean like the Tea Party? Well, uh, yeah, that's where I was going. So, for example, what you get is you get Heritage Action. I don't know if you know about this, but Heritage Action grows out of the Heritage Foundation, but it's in fact almost entirely devoted to active promotion of candidates or particular policies in particular states, okay? Something like the Center for Economics and Liberty or something at George Mason. Yeah, well, actually, they don't get to this level. I mean, this level is partly a place to park politicians who are out of office temporarily, right? So, you know, they have a kind of a place to be in waiting, and, and that's where we finally get to the Tea Party the genesis of AstroTurf organizations, and that there are also dedicated organizations to AstroTurf around particular issues. And I hope people understand what AstroTurfing is. It's like the fake grass on a football pitch or something like that. And what it is, is it looks like it's grassroots. It looks like it spontaneously grew up around a particular issue with a bunch of people interested in that issue organizing. But in fact, what you have is professional organizers who are making those things happen. And there has been some very good work on the Tea Party itself and the ways in which the Tea Party was, was at a very early stage, essentially stage managed by one of these, a couple of these AstroTurf organizations. See, so that's part of the Russian doll, too. You see, this is amazingly elaborate. And there is no equivalent on the left. I get so tired of people saying, oh, well, there's left think tanks and right think tanks. They, their organization is wildly different and way more sophisticated on the right, especially among the neoliberals. Right. So you talk about The Economist, and you know, a lot of your previous work is talking about you know, the development of economic theory and so on. Yeah. You make the crucial distinction between neoclassical economics, what is, what's taught in the profession, and neoliberalism, the political doctrine we're talking about now. But there's an important connection between the two in the sense that you say the economics profession has become more neoliberal. How did they fit into this yeah. Russian yeah. goal construction? Okay. As you can imagine, I, I'm doing a quick history lecture in two minutes here. But right. neoclassical economics was born around the 1870s. And in fact, I wrote a whole book about that called More Heat Than Light. I mean, basically what it was, was an imitation of physics, including appropriating the mathematics. So people should realize that economists 
mostly don't invent the mathematics they use. They usually rip it off from a natural science, and that's right, right. the case with neoclassical economics. Now, that is the story of the static allocation of things for given ends, okay, that earlier definition of economics. That actually is a description of what happened to neoclassical economics. Now, one important thing to know about neoclassical economics is that I think when students take it, take their intro classes these days and, and first learn about it, they seem to think that, oh, well, it's obviously right wing. Well, see, in history, that wasn't exactly the case. There were people who thought of themselves as socialists who were advocates of neoclassical theory, a version of neoclassical theory back in the 30s. So its politics was not written in stone, I think. So that is much more recent. It really only dates from after 1947. So the, the two are very different. The reason why people don't see the difference very clearly is because of the Chicago School. There is this overlap, <laughs> but it's, but it's right. only a part of neoliberalism. But there is a part of neoliberalism and tries to turn neoclassical theory towards more neoliberal politics and more neoliberal ideas. So I also do, however, claim that another reason people get confused is because the center, let's say the median neoclassical economist has become more neoliberal as we get closer to the present. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean that, remember, neoclassicism really is about having various endowments of things, but it's not the endowment that you really want. So you have to go to the market and sort of trade with other people to get what you really want. That's the way the market works in neoclassical economics. Over time, even the neoclassicals have moved away from that vision and more and more towards the vision of the market as an information processor. And currently, when you take microeconomics, much of microeconomics now is supposedly the economics of information or the efficient markets hypothesis and things like that. All of these things are like post-1970 developments, which make neoclassicism more and more like the kind of market that Hayek imagined. So the story is that they didn't have to go this way, but as neoliberalism becomes politically stronger and also kind of takes over more and more of the economics profession, the actual microeconomic theory becomes more neoliberal through time. And I just want to mention one more thing. Because this is a very subtle point, another scholar, Eddie Nick Ka, and I have just finished another book on the history of the economics of information, where we argue this in great detail, that, um, that the modern economist doesn't even know that he's neoliberal, because all he does is he pays attention mostly to the mathematics. But in fact, if we trace through time the changes of how the market is described, we see the market becoming more and more like a neoliberal market. Right. Yes. So I suppose the main problem that, you know, people on the left have with your thesis is that the way that the center left certainly likes to tell the history of the last 30 years is that even talking for, you know, scholars of political economy and so on, they like to talk about the rise of monetarism, the rise of quote unquote free market economics yes. in its various yes. varieties. And, you know, there's this change in the idea of governance, you know, political people in political economy will talk about, you know, governance of central banks, the idea of inflation targeting and all of sure. this stuff sure. and sure. different ideas of e economic governance. And all this stuff you're talking about, think tanks and all that is really subordinate to this intellectual battle, which is really bureaucratic and, you know, based on economic scholarship, you know, political economy, game theory, all this other stuff. Even in the far left, far right too, but even in the far left, that's sort of true. You can think of David Harvey's book, The New Imperialism, which basically posits just that. Yeah, right. I have often said that David Harvey does not understand the history of economics at all, in the sense that he's constantly conflating neoclassical economics with neoliberal theory, and that's a mistake, as I've tried to suggest. You know, you have to be careful it's coming from a Marxist position. And Marxists don't understand all of these kind of shifting battles within the orthodoxy because, you know, they why would they, right? They don't <laughs> pay that much attention to it. So, of course, it doesn't make any sense to them. 
As for people in political economy, they do, of course, glom on to the things that get a lot of attention at various points in history, like monetarism. Okay? What's interesting about monetarism is, yes, of course, monetarism was one neoliberal doctrine. But what's interesting is that it didn't work very well, and it was dropped relatively quickly. So, as it turns out, monetarism is a relatively dispensable, small subpart of neoliberalism, not at all central to it. In fact, one of the big divides within the neoliberal thought collective still is their attitudes towards money and how you control money. Just to caricature, kind of make a cartoon. From the Austrian side, they honestly believe that you could have total free banking, which means that there should be no central bank at all. And they still believe this, which is amazing after all this time. But on the other side, you kind of get these people who used to be monetarists and now perhaps are some kind of rational expectations person or something like that, who believe that the central bank needs to exist, but of course it has to be entirely cut off from any democratic or governance processes and essentially run by well, economists, pretty much. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. Now, those two positions can easily live still within the neoliberal thought collective. See? Right. Because they argue these out. And because, notice, both of them are opposed to the thing that they really, really hate, is that there would be any political control over money and banking. Right. That's the thing that they could never, never allow or countenance. And so notice, both of those positions exist to argue from different, essentially, you know, different angles against the same thing. And I would argue that that's really how neoliberalism works anyway, is that, you know, they're, again, way more imaginative than the left, because they develop multiple positions, which, you know, crudely might seem to contradict each other, but in fact always take up the entire space of political discussion and crowd out and prevent any leftist version of right. a possibility. Right. See, so the way they do it is by developing these multiple possibilities, which right. then become, you know, the entire array of possible legitimate discussion in any political situation. Right. And I suppose this moves us nicely on to three-step response that you develop for neoliberals to crises, and this sort of relates to how they set the discussion. So what's this response to crises? You can take the example of global warming. This is a little hard to get people to understand, too, because there's a kind of a general pattern of responses to crises. And by the way, Naomi Klein was great in that she got people's attention that neoliberals use crises, but she doesn't understand the way that they use crises, and that's perhaps one objection I would have to some of her work. So there's a kind of a general pattern, and then you can see how the pattern actually is put into play in particular big crises. So let me tell the pattern, then I'm going to describe how the pattern actually looks with something like global warming and then something like the global economic crisis. Okay, what's the pattern? The pattern is, in the short term, of course, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off, they just want to do something, you know, they might actually want to involve the state in the crisis in ways that the neoliberals, you know, don't want to oppose, don't like, so forth and so on. By the way, let's be clear about this. The neoliberals will also want to involve the state in the crisis, but only in certain ways, okay? So what do they do in the short term? In the short term, basically, they create a fog of doubt in the public as to what experts believe and what it is even possible to do, okay? So I think of this as a kind of a denialism. You might deny that the crisis is important, or you might just sort of, you know, create all kinds of trial balloons to confuse people. In the medium term, what you do, if you are going to blame the market for whatever the crisis is, the best thing to do is to create more markets, and possibly even stranger markets, in order to fix the problems already thrown up by the market. Okay, And by the way, whenever you see anything like that, that's always a neoliberal invention, usually coming out of you know, the relevant think tanks and so forth. But both of those actually are only attempts to kind of have holding actions so that they can develop the political ability to introduce their long-term real solution to the crisis. Okay. And that long-term solution to the crisis is to allow entrepreneurs to develop wild ideas that will transcend any crisis, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what does that look like in the case of something like global warming? Well, see, this makes it much more concrete. The short term is, of course, denying that there is any global warming. You see, that's the fog of doubt. Okay, so that's one thing that you do. And we know that, you know, we've got, this has been well, well documented, that many neoliberal think tanks explicitly have promulgated this kind of doubt. The medium term solution in global warming is to have cap and trade with tradable permits. You see, a market will fix something that the market already created a problem in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that is that the cap and trade stuff, I mean, anybody who's studied it for any length of time realizes that it doesn't work. And I want to be clear on that. That it has never slowed the growth of emissions of carbon dioxide anywhere at any time, even though a number of these schemes exist. What I want to suggest is that the neoliberals know that. That also is just a short-term stopgap to make people on the left think that they're actually doing something about the problem, at the same time pandering essentially to the financial sphere, which is uh, something that's very important to the neoliberals, to, to create uh, space for the long-term solution. And the long-term solution is that you have to have entrepreneurs develop these wild ideas of how we are going to fix the situation. And, of course, the wild ideas are already there. They're already being developed by, by um, various uh, neoliberal uh, think tanks, and it has to do with geoengineering. And usually here's where I go into a whole spiel about what geoengineering is, but I'm going to skip that here because I want to make sure that I show that the same kind of thing happened in the financial crisis. So the pattern is the same, even though the crisis is different, okay? Right. How does this pattern play itself out in the financial crisis? Well, first, sheer denialism, and I document some of that in the book, that there are these people, these economists who come out and say, oh, no, there's no real crisis. I mean, if you just, you know, get out of the way, the market will fix itself, or people are overstating what the problems are, you know, there aren't really any problems, and so forth. You see that kind of denialism is also there. So like denying the housing bubble and stuff Yeah, like well, or denying that the market would be unable to correct itself. Right. All right, that's really was the position there. Then we get the second medium-term way, which is to have more markets to fix things that seem to be going wrong with markets. And I think people don't realize the extent to which many of the Federal Reserve's actions to staunch the crisis were, in fact, privatized. Rather than the Fed itself going out and organizing these rescue packages, it sort of outsourced them to big investment firms so that the investment firms who crash the economy are the ones who are also essentially being paid to supposedly rescue the economy. So that's another one of those markets to fix markets. But of course, as we all know, that doesn't work either, and it didn't work then. And see, this is the part that I, people can't hear when I say it. I think the neoliberals knew that it wouldn't work, okay? That really what they want ultimately is for entrepreneurs to somehow fix the crisis. And in this particular case, it's this whole idea that anytime you run into problems with the financial sphere, all you have to do is you have to allow entrepreneurs to invent even more Baroque and stranger financial instruments, which will somehow fix everything. Right. And one very good example, very clean example of this is uh, Robert Schiller's book, The Good Society on Finance. Even before Finance and the Good Society, there was this book he released in, I think, 2000 called Macro Markets, right, where you create certain financial instruments to hedge against macroeconomic risks. Right. In the context of healthcare, something like Obamacare seems to be an example of a sort of response to socialized medicine. Oh, yeah. Obamacare is that medium-term response. A lot of journalists have talked about this, that the, the Obamacare plan was originally Romney Care uh, plan, and where did that come from? That, that came from a proposal a couple of decades before from the Heritage Foundation. Heritage right. Foundation is part of the neoliberal thought collective. I mean, see, it's just that what they've done is they've managed to occupy the entire legitimate space of political discussion. So the only things that you can consider are neoliberal projects to fix problems, perceived problems. Right. They're constantly able to do this in one situation after another, and the left really just does not get it. I mean, they cannot see it. Um, it's really... So 
misled. So the liberal left, which is the only left that really matters in the states, does end up actually doing neoliberal bidding for them in a lot of ways. Well, but that's the whole point of this multi-phased project. I would argue that the, the denialism, of course, is something that's easy for the left to hate, right? Well, that's right. a good thing, actually, you see, because then what happens is they say, oh, well, let's be you know, responsible and do something, whatever we can just do to achieve. And so, of course, what's sitting there waiting for them? I mean, if we're thinking about global warming, it's the cap and trade stuff, that case of, you know, health care, the obfuscation is, oh, everyone can take care of themselves, right? There's no health problem in the United States. Right. And then the neoliberal medium term is that is, oh, okay, we'll just create more state-created markets for insurance, which will somehow force more people into the system, and that what will happen then is that the problem will be fixed. And, of course, it won't. You see, so, I mean, the pattern really is the same. Right. You can see it in education, too, with semi-privatization and charter schools, actually. It's the same. It is the same pattern. That's right. It is the same pattern. I agree. And so... Why does the left constantly get suckered into this? <laughs> I mean that, seriously. It really lacks the kind of intellectual capacity to realize that it's being snookered in the same way over and over and over again. Right. Just to sort of get this clear before we move on to sort of everyday neoliberalism and the rest of your final bit of your thesis. Sure. The way that the neoliberals focus is thinking about society in an epistemological way, referring to this entity of the market. I do stress that. I mean, I don't mean to say that that's the only thing. Right. But no, I'm just, just to sort of generalize it, yeah, obviously. Right. Be, but I think it is the thing that people don't pay attention to. That they still think that the right believes in laissez-faire. I mean, that, it's just totally right. irrelevant. You know, that's, that doesn't begin to capture what they believe. Right. So there's this big market entity, and it's almost that the organization of the neoliberal thought collective is supposed to reflect their view of the market. And the way they do this is not just through, you know, state power, you know, the, the imposition of certain intellectual programs and policies. It's by restricting the space of debate. It's by throwing mud in the market for ideas. And the core insight seems to me to be a deeply sophisticated understanding of how discourse in mass democracy is generated by the market for ideas and various elites and sort of power relations within this market. Oh, that's, that's very much the case. See, that traces back to Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann's Good Society was precisely about that. So it was this whole issue of, you know, how do you deal politically with a democratic mass society from the neoliberal point of view with regard to their obvious shortcomings with regard to epistemology and the inability of people to see that the way to fix this is through the market. And it is very interesting that, you know, you were on Adam Curtis's film, The Trap. Right. Yep. Right. His kind of thesis across a lot of his work, you know, the century of the self and stuff like that seems to be quite similar. Yes. This was before I had published any of this stuff on neoliberalism. The reason he approached me was because of an earlier book called Machine Dreams, actually where I talked instead about the effects of philosophical positions about mind and so forth, and also the computer on the economic orthodoxy at that point. That's what that was about. Right. And it's also important to stress that even if there's this broad epistemological idea that we uncover through historiographical work, it's not necessarily clear that it exists in each individual, it's sort of something like an emergent phenomena, which emerges from these, this institutional construction. Okay, I mean, you could say that, and I often have people, again, I get a lot of people who really don't believe that neoliberalism exists in one way or another, some fashion or another. And one of the ways that they come at me on this is that, well, pick a particular neoliberal, would they understand that a lot of what their political program is about is about epistemology? Actually, they do know. And why do I know that? Because why do they keep praising Hayek so much? It's because Hayek is one of the clearest early statements of precisely that issue, that the way to understand politics is through understanding knowledge. And so even if they're not, you know, very perceptive or deep thinkers about this. And by the way, that's actually kind of smart about these guys, too, that they realize there has to be a deep division of labor 
in their political project. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to understand how the political project hangs together in every way. They actually know that, okay? All that's necessary is that they see a couple of the big themes. And the, the most important big theme that I think any neoliberal knows is that the two-line mm -hmm. disproof of socialism is that the market is smarter than anyone else, and so the government can never outdo or out-organize the market. Right. I think every neoliberal knows those two lines, and you see, that's enough. That's good enough. So I suppose, finally, to sort of answer why you think there is no effective left critique, you have this notion of yeah. everyday neoliberalism. It's penetrated not only the intellectual discourse, it's penetrated everyday life and how people think about themselves, and even places like the Occupy movement. Yeah, okay. Although, again, this is going to be a very short version. We originally thought that we would bring up Foucault with regard to this. And actually, this is one place that he would show up that's very important. See, Foucault is an important intellectual figure because he realized that neoliberalism wasn't solely or most importantly about narrowly conceived economics. And that neoliberalism really is a much more general philosophy of governance and how governance would come about in a modern situation. Mm -hmm. Just to summarize from his important and insightful and amazingly prescient late lectures, especially the biopolitics lectures, he argues that agency has been totally transformed in neoliberalism. And I agree, actually, with that. Agency in neoliberal theory is that you have to be an entrepreneur of yourself. And the reason you have to be an entrepreneur of yourself is because you can never know enough to understand what your true nature is or should be. I think this is fascinating. So instead, because you're a flawed thinker, transform yourself according to various packets of truth that are delivered to you by the market. <laughs> okay? See? So, I mean, you know, it's not that I think myself through and decide what I must be. It's that the market, who always knows more than me, is telling me what I have to be. If, that, if that's the case, then there is no unique true self to be faithful to anymore. Everything about you could be outsourced, could be altered, could be invested in, could be divested. Mm -hmm. You see? I mean, you become this kind of, uh, I mean, you're a little like a firm, but, you know, more, more to the point, you know, you have no characteristic identity and certainly no class identity. See, one of the purposes of this, and he saw that early on, was to destroy the entire idea of class, that there is no idea of class if everyone is totally malleable in this way. Okay. So that's the Foucault side now. You know, it's okay to talk about that in very abstract terms. And remember, that was a long time ago. That was like 77, 78 when he was talking yeah. about that. How does that show up in everyday life? Well, like, you know, there's a whole chapter of the book about it, but I think most people know some aspects of this. So, for example, education, which you guys brought up. Education used to be, in this old Kantian sense, about finding yourself, right? I mean, I've become wiser and, you know, I know what I really am and what I can really do. Well, forget about that, and forget about education developing a solid citizenry who is capable of making decisions in a democracy. Forget about that, too. Rather, education is just investing in human capital for a future payoff. That's it. And see, that's why Gary Becker is such an important member of the Thought Collective as well, because he invents this idea. So, in this kind of world where I'm constantly, you know, sort of getting signals as to how I should change and what I should do and what I should buy, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur myself, I can't just, like, passively buy stuff. I only really am going to become a true active agent if I take risk. <laughs> See, because that's the nature of entrepreneurship, at least in this way of thinking. The trade-off between risk and return and all this stuff. Well, you have to take risks in order to really become whatever it is that the market can fully appreciate in a weird sort of way, okay? Right. Because, you know, you're supposed to be taking these risks, of course, risk can go bad, right? Stuff can go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's all my fault, do you see? Nothing is the fault of the system. 
anymore. It's, it's a beautiful way of sort of you know, divesting any kind of social determination from the agent. Because this is the foundation of all kinds of left critique. You talk about society, you talk about the laws of capital or whatever. Exactly. See, notice, it isn't just Margaret Thatcher rabbiting on about there's no such thing as society. The, this construction of what it means to be a human being makes it impossible to think about a society as being, in any sense, determinative. Okay? Right. So that's really pretty amazing that you know you, people can be brought around to see themselves in this way. And so, basically, you got to kind of monitor yourself taking these risks. So that's why in the chapter I go on and on about credit scores to a certain extent. You see, credit scores, by the way, didn't exist before the 70s. I don't, people don't even know that. Credit scores are a way of kind of you monitoring yourself and, of course, outsiders monitoring you. So that would be one example of this. But there's another. This is the work of Ilana Gershon, which I think probably needs to be better known. An anthropologist, by the way. Uh, these people are doing some of the best work on this stuff, certainly not economists. She has a wonderful set of articles on how Facebook is like training wheels for young people as to how to be a neoliberal agent. And I think that's exactly right. It takes your information for free and sells it to others for a profit. See, that's very important. So it sort of shows you how this kind of marketplace of ideas works. Moreover, if some of your revelations about yourself are embarrassing or just wrong. It's not up to Facebook to fix it. It's all up to you somehow. Right. Which is amazing. You see how there's no social determination there? You construct a profile, not from stuff that you thought up, but from largely stereotypic materials. Notice the market gives you the possibilities of what it is that you could even be or how you could be described. And then it imposes metrics, see, kind of quasi-markets, right. which is so, of course, important to neoliberals. So, for example, how many people friend you and all the rest of it. And you constantly have little counters to see how many friends have you got. And so it isn't the way the world is. It's, it's training wheels to see the world a certain way. Right. Okay. And so that's the beauty of a lot of her work is she shows you that people – even if they don't care about political theory, and most people don't, I'm fully aware of that, there are all kinds of ways to train people to see the world through neoliberal glasses in ways that they're not even conscious of, although they feel like they have to participate in them. You know, at least these days, most young people feel like they have to be you know, on Facebook or whatever. I would argue that there are all these things that acclimatize people to seeing themselves as this kind of neoliberal agent. Finally, just because it connects, because what you ended up with, with Facebook and the construction of power through Facebook, it connects really well with what you critiqued about the Occupy movement. Yeah, the Occupy movement was really interesting, and a lot of people saw it as a hopeful development. I remember having mixed feelings myself back then. And the first thing that gave me a hint that there might be something slightly neoliberal about this whole thing was the way in which there was this belief that the ideas that would be needed to counter the crisis would bubble up kind of spontaneously from people just getting up and talking, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and also the idea that we just gave everyone their 10 minutes or whatever, that somehow, you know, it would just bubble up by itself. This amazing hostility to the idea that intellectual... Political economy, but political ideas generally, need to be developed consciously over long periods of time. <laughs> People need to devote themselves to it. And what was amazing about the Occupy movement was they, they just didn't believe that that was true, that it would just happen sort of by itself. So that made me nervous to a, to, to a certain extent. And what's interesting about it is that Occupy, in a sense, was acting according to some of the stated visions of the neoliberals, but not according to their behavior, <laughs> all right? Neoliberals have some of these stories that much order really is spontaneous order, and that if you just let it bubble up, it'll happen by itself. I mean, you know, Hayek's got a bunch of that. A lot of them have a lot of it. But what's interesting is that they don't live it. That's not how they organize. That's not how they have developed a political movement. See, so there's a difference between what they preach and what they do. And the Occupy movement was obeying what they preached as opposed to what they did. 
ironic that neoliberals essentially operate as a vanguard party. Oh, yeah. They've learned from Lenin. I'm sorry. And it's not like some of them haven't read Lenin. I mean, they have. They mention it themselves and so forth. I mean, they, they studied the Communist Party very closely in those early days. And there's certain aspects of their organization, a political notion of, a, of a, not a vanguard party, but a vanguard development of intellectual firepower to support certain political activities. They really do understand that, I think, fairly well. More importantly than that, they also believe in organization. No matter what they say, that's what they do. And it was there from the beginning. There were a number of people in Mont Pelerin who wanted to, in fact, act like classical liberals. They wanted to have some left-wing people come into Mont Pelerin, and they wanted to argue about socialism with them and all that kind of stuff. By the way, one of them was Karl Popper, of all people. Strange but true, okay? Now, Hayek considered that, and he decided, no. That, that, that that's not the way this is going to work over time. It's just not going to be politically successful if you do that, all right? And see, weirdly enough, the Occupy movement is the Karl Popper position. <laughs> you read some of the stuff like the Occupy Handbook and so forth. I have all these, by the way. And the Occupy Handbook has a huge representation of neoliberal writers in it. Right? Mont Pelerin would never do anything like that. Right. They would never give their opponents that much space. And so Occupy really just has an incredibly, or had, it doesn't exist anymore, had an incredibly befuddled understanding of epistemology and political epistemology. They didn't understand how you develop political ideas around a political project. But there's also this thing that you say in the book about clicktivism or something of this nature. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know who's good on that? Is that I don't know if you guys have read any Evgeny Morozov lately. Oh, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. He's more and more coming around to the position that a lot of this verbiage about you know, the wonderful effects of the web and so forth is, in fact, just kind of reprocessed neoliberalism. And, you know, he's coming to understand, I think, the political theory more and more now as, as time goes on. And he's more and more been explicitly saying this, not so much in the books yet, but in some of the stuff he's written for newspapers. And see, that's another place to go, that this whole idea that the web opens up all this kind of new political opportunities is, again, a naive way of thinking about political epistemology. Just before we end, I suppose we have to ask a question about the future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a bit open-ended, but do you think that anyone on the left has cottoned onto your thesis? People come up to me sometime and say, am I, personally, saying that the left needs to imitate the Mont Pelerin Society and have something like that? And, you know, I don't want to <laughs> exactly say that because that's a little bit weird. That says that we have to imitate everything that they did. And politically, I think most people would find that an anathema because they've done some pretty ropey things in order to succeed and, and win. But it is true that I think either this nostalgia about Marxism or worse, this kind of Krugman nostalgia about Keynes is really totally ineffectual against neoliberalism. Those were the doctrines that neoliberalism were developed to defeat. And they successfully did so. I mean, we have to be honest about that, that they have displaced those doctrines for good, serious reasons. The reason they come up again is because there's nothing else. You have to reach back for what remains. You're right. This kind of thing is precisely the kind of thing that they had to argue out back when they were behind the eight ball, right? How much do you reach back? How much do you change what you believe and so forth? Now, if you're asking me personally, do I think there's other things? Yes. I mean, that's one of the reasons I do history of economics, because I think there are really important forks in the road. One guy named William Thomas Thornton, back in the 1860s, argued that this whole idea that unions were bad for the market presumed that the market operated in the same way everywhere, every time throughout history. And his argument was, no, different markets, different market forms produce different results. And when it comes to labor, 
the idea that labor could reserve itself, you know, not be forced to offer itself <laughs> at, at whatever the going price was from the employers is actually just a change in the market form. So unions were perfectly legitimate development. Most people don't even know that. And they also don't know that early Marxism was hostile to trade unionism in many ways. But wasn't that just an integration of unions into a market discourse? Uh, well, see, but this is part of the issue, is that I think Hayek was brilliant in that he saw he had to change what people thought a market was in order to be the intellectual center of a political project. But that's a lesson that the left hasn't learned. That the left actually, as opposed to being kind of knee-jerk just against the market, should understand that it has to change the story of what markets are and what they do. If we're able to change that story, actually it could be go a long way toward undermining the neoliberal position, but it would also give rise to a different kind of vision of what sort of society that the left is working for. Okay, I'm just giving you one example. But see, so there are other things, but it's true that they are considered to be the dominant alternatives by the left. That's all. Sorry, just why do we have to talk about the market, right? I mean, you're talking about different ways that we can think about market. It doesn't have to be just that. And in fact, remember, it wasn't just that for the neoliberals either. But you're asking me, is there nothing else? And I'm telling you, no, in the history of economics, there is something else. Right. It's just not very popular and no one is entertaining it. Right. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's like the be-all, end-all or anything. Because clearly, another consequence of my argument is that the story of what an agent is has to change too, right? Right. So that would be different again. I mean, see, that's a different vision of humanity and what humanity is becoming. And so I could see a bunch of people on the left getting together and arguing over transhumanism, for example, which sounds weird. But see, that's the kind of blue sky thinking that the neoliberals were willing to do back in the 40s. We'd like to thank you for listening to Cinematic Retness. Please remember to leave reviews on the iTunes page and please support us at our Patreon account at Patreon slash Symptomatic Redness. We'd like to thank our producer, Max, as well as all of our fans who participate in our Facebook group or our Facebook page. Please follow us on Facebook. If you want to find out anything more about Amoga, you can visit his blog entitled Thoughts if you want to find out more about C. Derek Vaughan, you can visit his blog, Symptomatic Commentary. Thank you, and good day. <laughs>